Hello my dear students and welcome once again to Zenith Academy Online. Today we are doing a very important chapter from ICST class 10 that is endocrine glands and this is part 1 of the lecture series for endocrine glands. So the first question arises in our mind is why do we need an endocrine system for the regulation of body activities? So why there is a need of regulation of body activities? We all know that in our body, there are many uh, systems that are there. This is a respiratory system. This is a skeletal system, muscular system. You can see this is a digestive system, circulatory system, nervous system. So, all these systems go hand in hand. Okay. So, the functioning of one system depends on the other. And there is a harmonious relationship, a coordination between all these systems so that our body can work efficiently right so there has to be a regulation in these activities one after another something should happen so if the muscles will contract then only the bone will move okay so all of them are interrelated so the activities in our body are highly complex right we all know that we have highly complex body so the activities in our body are highly complex and they need to be so regulated that every activity takes place at a proper time and in a correct sequence. Every activity should take place at its time and in a proper sequence one by one. That is why we need a regular a regulation of the body activities and endocrine system plays a very vital role in it. Right? For example, gastric juice bile juice and pancreatic juice should be poured into the food canal only when there is food in it. So, if you see this, whenever there is food in our stomach, okay, then only you can see saliva pouring in, bile pouring in, intestinal juice pouring in, right, from the stomach acid uh, pours in, pancreatic juice pours in, whenever there is food. So, if there is no food, these juices will not be released. So, there is a coordination, right? So, though this kind of regulation is done to some extent by nervous system. You know what is nervous system? I have already explained you nervous system. You can see here an example. There is a nerve cell neuron. Okay. So, the message, okay, is passed through this axon. Uh, so, this is the action potential. And then the neurotransmitter gives the signal, gives the chemical signal. See, neurotransmitter. See, neurotransmitter receptor molecule. Okay, this is the neurotransmitter receptor molecule. You can see here and this is the target cell. So, here through the nerve impulse, okay, not through chemicals, sorry, through nerve impulse, through electrical signals we can say, okay, this regulation is done. But, okay, it is also bought by chemical regulators called hormones. So, here there is electric signal or nerve impulse which passes through this long axon. Okay, then there are neurotransmitter molecules which is accepted by neuroreceptor molecule and it affects the target cell. Right? But here what happens? Now it is also brought about, this regulation is also brought about by chemical regulators called hormones. So can you see this is an endocrine gland or an endocrine cell? So from this the hormone molecules are released. Now, where these, these hormone molecules go, there is no uh, duct, okay, there is no axon here. So, what happens? It is directly poured into the blood. So, you can see here a blood vessel. So, this is getting poured into the blood. Now, through the blood vessels, okay, through the blood, it receives the, it goes to the target cell, jahan pe uska requirement hai, right? And here is the hormone receptor molecule on the target cell and these hormones are received here, right? So, the regulation is brought about by two. First is through nervous system, through nerve impulses and second is by chemical regulators called hormones. Where horma means to stir up, to excite or to put into action. So, now let's talk about what is the difference between this neural control and hormonal control. So, neural control, its action is always and always quick. There is a quick action. There are long axons in our body, long nerve fibers in our body. 
so whenever there is a uh, whenever we are talking about a neural control the action is very quick okay the message passes through an electrical signal so it passes very quickly and to the brain it takes the message and again from the brain it takes to the target organ very quickly right hormonal control now hormonal control at times may be quick also but most of the times it is slow acting so it may be quick acting or slow acting now in neural control the information is transmitted as electrochemical nerve impulse remember information is transmitted in the neural control as electrochemical nerve nerve impulses whereas in hormonal control the information is transmitted as chemical messengers called hormones so here the nerve impulse that are electrical in nature electrochemical nerve impulse uh, takes the messages and here the hormones take the messages and they are known as chemical messengers okay now in neural control the impulse transmission occurs through nerve fibers we saw in the diagram the transmission is happening through the nerve fibers okay through the long axons it is traveling now here the hormonal transmission occurs through blood we sh showed you the diagram the hormones were directly uh, poured into blood in the neural control the information would be towards a specific direction the effector organ or the central nervous system therefore it affects only the particular muscles or the glands and we can say its effect is local okay what do you mean by this see whenever there is a neural message okay it will travel in a particular direction and it will directly reach the effector organ either it will reach the effector organ directly the messages from the brain will reach to the effector organ if we have touched something hot and then we will uh, release our hand or the information when you touch something the information from this skin goes to the central nervous system so two ways it is there so information would be towards a specific direction either effector organ or the central nervous system and therefore it affects only the particular muscles right agar if the information is coming from here to the muscles here that bachcho haath hata lo koi garam cheez hai right so it is affecting a particular muscle right or if there is a gland involved in it ki koi hormone secrete karna hai for example if you see a uh, your favorite food okay your salivary glands start secreting saliva right this is also a neural control so here also it is affecting your salivary glands so it is affecting a particular gland so that is why we say its action is local but what happens in hormonal control hormones are directly released in the general blood circulation directly hormones are released in the blood from where it is taken by the blood to the uh, specific uh, receptor and therefore it affects so it so blood travels through every body part it will go to every body part so it affects different organs as well okay so its effect is felt widespread in the body okay because it is not going in a particular direction through a nerve it is poured into the blood so blood is taken to uh, it goes to every body part so every body part is affected every organ is affected but what happens receptor is at the target organ only so though the effect is been felt widespread in the body but target organs takes up maximum of that hormones okay now in neural control it is suitable for quick reactions like reflexes as i gave you the example of reflexes just now okay it is suitable for quick reactions but in hormonal control it is suitable for long term changes such as the maintenance of pregnancy pregnancy happens for a period of 36 weeks or you can say for a period of 9 months so for the 9 months the same hormones make long term changes in your body okay the effect is short time okay in neural control the effect is short time and this is a long lasting effect now in neural control neural control cannot affect growth whereas hormonal control can affect growth when we talk about growth hormones and other hormones in the upcoming lectures you will understand that due to hormones due to over secretion of maybe a hormone uh, there is a disease called gigantism due to 
uh, less secretion dwarfism so it affects growth of our body whereas neural control does not affect growth now neural control does not influence chemical changes and hence it cannot regulate the metabolism we know here there are no chemicals involved here there is only electrochemical nerve impulse that is going okay so it is not influencing any chemical change in our body and therefore the metabolism of our body is not affected it is not been influenced by neural control neural control whereas in hormonal control it can bring about specific chemical changes and it regulates our metabolism now in neural control this can be modified to some extent by learning from the previous experience now if we know okay the smell of certain food or if we know that this is our favorite food so our saliva will start secreting right if we know that this object is hot we will from the previous experience we know it is hot so we will not touch it so neural control is modified to some extent by learning from the previous experience whereas hormon hormonal control cannot be modified by learning from previous experience i hope you have understood this so let us talk about hormones in detail now hormones what are hormones hormones are secretions kahan se secrete hote hain hormones are secretions from specific cell or glands and then they are carried to all the parts of the blood but okay they are carried to all the parts by blood but their effect is produced in one or more specific parts that is target organs or cells only okay so now you see this is the secreting cell okay it can be a specific cell or a gland okay it is secreted by this can you see this green colored hormones now these hormones enter the blood stream it is entering the blood stream now the blood takes it to each and every organ okay but not everywhere it is released now here you can see a target cell now target cell has this type of a shape okay these are called receptor organs so a particular hormone will fit into a particular receptor organ of a particular target cell only right so if it fits into this okay you can see here it is fitting into this it is going here and fitting into this right so hormones are secreted from specific cells or glands they are poured into the blood stream they are taken to different parts by blood but their effect is produced in one or more specific parts known as target organs or target cells only right because different target organs different target cells have different receptors which are specific for a particular hormone like a lock and key system isn't it a particular lock gets opened only by a particular key in the same way there are different receptors for different hormones so that is why it acts at a specific part or specific target organ only the effect is produced only there now why are hormones called chemical messengers this is a very common question that is asked ki hormones ko chemical messenger kyu kaha jata hai the hormones are carried to all the parts of the blood body through blood circulation to bring about the hor harmonious working of the body so they are called chemical messengers i have already explained you this now what happens when there is an excess secretion of these hormones so this is known as hypo sorry uh, what hap, hypo is uh, when it is in lower quantity okay hyper is when it is in excess i am so sorry hypo means when it is lower okay what happens when there is a less secretion of a particular hormone so it is known as hyposecretion this refers to condition where the hormone is secreted in lower than normal quantities so different hormones cause different deficiency obviously when it is uh, secreted in a lesser quantity so there will be a deficiency and different deficiencies are caused due to hyposecretion of different hormones this we will study in the upcoming lectures well where i'll talk about different endocrine glands and the hormones secreted by them now hyper hyper matlab zyada hai na hum bolte hai ki some kid is very hyper the bahut zyada active hai right so hyper is more hyper is more secretion 
so this refers to a condition where the hormone is secreted in excess different hormones cause different condition when secreted in excess this also we will study in the upcoming lectures okay now let's talk about the general properties of hormones so first the hormones are secreted from their source directly into the blood i told you from a secreting cell or a secreting gland it goes directly into the blood and not into the lymph okay many a times students get confused it gets poured into the blood and not into the lymph okay second not into the lymph second they regulate the physiological process by chemical means hai na neural wala kaun sa tha neural was electrochemical nerve impulse electrochemical means right and this is chemical means that was electric impulse and this is purely chemicals so kaise regulate karte hain by chemical means they affect the enzyme system of our body next property is they act on the target organs or cells which are usually away from the source so the uh, hormones are secreted at one place okay for example the thyroid uh, thyroid and parathyroid secrete some hormones okay and it is been used at some different body part which is far away from this place isn't it so they act on target cell organs or cells which are usually away from the source then hormones produced in one species usually show similar influence in the other species this also you should remember that a growth hormone for example will produce the same effect in one species okay in one species also it will bring about the changes in the growth pattern so similar uh, influ uh, influence is shown in other species also it's not that it will show some other effect in some other uh, species right growth hormone will show growth only whether it is you know secreted in humans or secreted in some other animals now next property is they are produced in very very small quantities we can say in trace quantities they are produced and they are biologically extremely active. ओके, सो दैट इज वाई मिस्टे बहुत कम ठीक है कम क्वांटिटी में रिलीज होने के बाद भी बहुत बायोलॉजिकली एक्टिव है इतना सा भी इतना एक्टिव है कि सब काम हो जाता है फॉर एग्जाम्पल एड्रीनलिन इज एक्टिव इवन इन अ कंसेंट्रेशन ऑफ वन पार्ट इन दीज मेनी पार्ट कैन यू सी हाउ मेनी जीरो वन टू थ्री फोर फाइव सिक्स सेवन एट थ्री एंड एट जीरो तो इतने सारे पार्ट्स में अगर एक पार्ट एड्रेनलिन है तो भी वो एक्टिव है राइट सो केमिकली सम हॉर्मोन्स आर पेप्टाइड्स व्हाट आर पेप्टाइड्स प्रोटीन सच एस इंसुलिन ओके सो केमिकली सम हॉर्मोन्स आर पेप्टाइड्स लाइक प्रोटीन सच एस इंसुलिन विच आर वॉटर सोल्यूबल सो पेप्टाइड आर वॉटर सोल्यूबल सम आर अमाइंस Amines are derived from amino acids such as adrenaline. Again, they are also water soluble, and some are steroids. Steroids are which one? Which are derived from cholesterol such as testosterone. And steroids are lipid soluble. So you have to understand that hormones can be peptides, amines, or steroids. These two are water soluble, and this is lipid soluble. You should know ki peptide kya unse hote hai? Protein, jaise ki insulin. okay amines are derived from amino acids such as adrenaline and steroids are derived from cholesterol such as testosterone right so some hormones are peptides amines or steroids now their excess okay that is hyper hyper hai bachcha right excess hyper secretion or over secretion ya fir deficiency that is hypo or under secretion बोथ में लीड टू सीरियस कॉन्सिक्वेंसेस मतलब ज्यादा भी है यानी हाइपर या ओवर सेक्रेशन है तो भी प्रॉब्लम है या डेफिशिएंसी है मतलब कि हाइपो और अंडर सेक्रेशन है तो भी सीरियस कॉन्सिक्वेंसेस हो सकते हैं दिस वी विल टॉक अबाउट इन द अपकमिंग लेक्चर्स वेयर वी विल टेक ईच एंड एवरी एंडोक्राइन ग्लैंड सेपरेटली नाउ हॉर्मोन्स आर नॉट स्टोर्ड इन द बॉडी एनीवेयर ओके यू शुड रिमेंबर दे आर नॉट स्टोर्ड इन द बॉडी वंस द हॉर्मोन्स आर रिलीज they act upon a target organ and then they are flushed out of our body system okay so hormones are not stored in the body and are excreted from the system now let's talk about some interesting facts about hormones first 
sun glands for example pancreas okay now pancreas can both be endocrine as well as exocrine in nature endocrine ke kaun se glands hote hai beta ductless jinka koi duct nahi hota hai right they pour their secretion directly into the blood whereas exocrine are with ducts to kuch jo glands hote hain they are like pancreas can be both endocrine and exocrine in nature now testes and ovaries have dual function up next uh, jo hai testes and ovaries okay these are also our glands so they have two functions for example they produce hormones as well as gametes right we know what are the gametes okay male gamete is sperm and female gamete is ova so they produce hormones as well as gametes that are needed for the reproduction so it's not that if there is a endocrine gland it will only secrete hormone it can do two functions as well right the pituitary gland this is also very important the pituitary gland is called the master gland which is the master gland pituitary gland because what does the master do it controls everyone okay it controls all the people working under him so in the same way pituitary gland produces secretions they secrete some uh, they produce some secretions and these secretion control the action of other glands right so that is why pituitary gland is called master gland because it secretes it produces secretions to control the actions of other glands and last but not the least certain hormones are also produced from such glands this is such ऐसे ग्लैंड से प्रोड्यूस होते हैं और ऐसे बॉडी पार्ट से विच अदरवाइज हैव अ डिफरेंट प्राइमरी फंक्शन फॉर एग्जांपल स्टमक एंड डिओडेनम स्टमक हैज अ डिफरेंट हैज अ फंक्शन ऑफ कलेक्टिंग फूड स्टमक और डिओडेनम आल्सो हैज अ सर्टेन फंक्शन सो देयर प्राइमरी फंक्शन इज डिफरेंट बट दे आल्सो रिलीज सर्टेन हार्मोन्स सर्टेन सिक्रेशंस ओके स्टमक रिलीजेस गैस्ट्रिक जूस right do you remember so main function their primary function is something else but they also release certain hormones most hormones are secreted by special glands we have already studied these special glands are called endocrine glands endo means inside and crine means separate meaning secrete internally okay they secrete internally in the blood stream and since they do not have any duct they are known as ductless glands also because their secretions are poured directly into the blood and not through any special duct okay so i hope you have got a slight fair idea about what are endocrine glands endo inside crine separate they secrete internally and they are called ductless glands because they pour they pour their secretions directly into the blood stream now we know now what are endocrine glands so what are endo what is endocrine system so endocrine system consists of several glands bahut sare glands mila kar endocrine system banta hai so it consists of several glands or maybe glandular cells which brings about the overall common function of chemical coordination in the body we know what is the fun what is what does different uh, secretions or hormones do okay they bring about a chemical coordination in the body from the very first slide we have studied that why we need an endocrine system why we need endocrine glands so all these glands collectively work together to serve a common function of chemical coordination in the body so almost all the endocrine glands act in a coordinated manner the way in which all the organs of the digestive system work in a coordinated manner in the same way all these glands all these endocrine glands they act in a coordinated manner one after another and they activate each other and work as a system of organs called endocrine system so we know what is a system a system is defined as a group of organs performing an overall common function in the same way all the endocrine glands work in a coordinated manner they activate each other and work as a system of organs and this system of organs is known as endocrine system right so we will be talking uh, so we have these seven different endocrine glands that are found in our body pituitary gland it is the master gland thyroid gland parathyroid gland thymus gland pancreas adrenal gland and gonads that is testes testes and ovary 
okay in our portion we do not have to study all seven of them in detail but we should know that these are the seven endocrine glands found in our body okay these this is a pictorial representation okay so these are the different glands just that the gonads are different okay the gonads are different otherwise all the glands are common in male and female okay so in our next upcoming lecture we will be talking about these four glands that we have in our core so let me tell you first of all just let me take the ink yeah so adrenal glands are found on the top of each kidney can you see here these are the two kidneys and adrenal glands these are the two adrenal glands found on the top so adrenal glands are found on the top of each kidney even the name adrenal okay directly refers to their location how location because in latin ad means near and rens is always we know kidneys so it is near kidneys so adrenal is on the top of the kidney near kidneys so these glands are also known as suprarenal glands please note this the other name of gland is suprarenal glands in latin supra means above and renes means kidney right so this is another name for adrenal glands now if you see the diagram very carefully children both the glands do not look exactly the same okay can you see here see this diagram this is the right adrenal gland see this and this one is the left adrenal gland you can see these pictures on google and understand that these two does not look exactly the same so now each adrenal gland these both consist of two parts okay just let me so these consist of two parts one is a central medulla so in both of them can you see medulla this is the central part this part can you see this see where i am doing annotation so this is the central medulla so the inside the central part is known as medulla and peripheral peripheral means towards the periphery right in the corner so this is cortex can you see this on the periphery side this is the periphery side this is known as cortex so there are each adrenal gland consists of two parts medulla and cortex it is also known as adrenal medulla or adrenal cortex okay so first let's talk about adrenal medulla you remember what was medulla the central part see the diagram so now let's talk about adrenal medulla what does it secrete it secretes adrenaline okay also called called as epinephrine and noradrenaline actually they are slightly different from adrenaline okay but for your uh, syllabus you can consider them same okay they have a slight different function adrenaline is a hormone okay so first of you first of all you should remember what does it secrete it secretes adrenaline okay adrenaline is also known as epinephrine and this is a slightly different this secretes something else okay but for you you understand this is not adrenaline सो so, जो एड्रीनालिन है बेटा या एपिनेफ्राइन है वो एक हार्मोन है इट्स अ हार्मोन एंड व्हाट डज इट डू इट प्रिपेयर्स द बॉडी टू मीट एनी इमरजेंसी सिचुएशन फॉर फाइट दैट इज टू फेस द डेंजर और फॉर फ्लाइट दैट इज टू रन अवे फ्रॉम इट सो व्हाट डज इट मीन व्हाट इज फाइट और फ्लाइट इफ यू सी अ पोटेंशियल डेंजर सो दिस इज अ पोटेंशियल डेंजर इन फ्रंट ऑफ दैट मैन ही इज फाइटिंग इट और he will run away that's flight so our body okay the adrenaline prepares our body for two situations in situation of fight and flight in both these situation we need the secretion of adrenaline okay so let's talk about in fight or flight response what is the role of adrenaline the flight or flight response is a specific physiological response okay that happens when the individual faces perceived danger so whenever we face a danger there is a physiological response of our body okay so this mobilizes resources to either flee that is flight or fight the danger so this is a physiological response that happens when an individual faces the danger 
and it mobilizes it brings into action the resources in our body so what are the resources the different hormones and the enzymes okay they help us to either flight or fight now how it happens i will talk to you about that also so the activation of fight or flight response begins within milliseconds of a danger being perceived so whenever we see a danger coming or whenever we feel ke, okay this is a dangerous situation or this this is going to happen okay so within milliseconds okay this fight or flight response is activated okay and it la it can last up to an hour allowing for fast reactions times so the fight or flight response is carried out using the sympathetic nervous system and what does the sympathetic nervous system do it stimulates the hormone production it involves both the nervous and the endocrine system so actually when you talk about fight or flight both the systems are involved first the parasympathetic uh, uh, the sympathetic nervous system will tell okay will tell our adrenal glands okay, okay now there is a fight or flight response so uh, situation so you release adrenaline so as soon as our brain detects that it is uh, a fight or flight situation the adrenaline starts uh, the adrenal gland starts pumping out that uh, adrenaline okay and who instructs the sympathetic nervous system so it involves both nervous and endocrine systems so adrenaline adrenaline is the main hormone associated with fight or flight response so what are the physiological changes there will be some physiological changes right so physiological changes initiated by fight or flight response include increased heart and respiratory rate okay so whenever we see a danger what happens our heartbeat starts uh, very fast it becomes very fast okay we start breathing fast okay so, so that we can take in more oxygen which is required maybe by our muscles if we want to run or maybe by our brain if you want to think something or at that point okay so an increase of blood flow to the brain and limbs okay so heartbeat increases respiratory rate increases blood flow increases to the brain and the limbs because limbs will be used to either hit him or to run okay increased sweating and trembling muscles all these are the physical changes that we see in our body during this fight or flight response now how does it work the fight or flight response is a chain of physiological events in the body that happens in response to a stimulus that is perceived as dangerous agar koi aisa stimulus hai jo ki hame lag raha hai ki dangerous hai we are perceiving it as dangerous then there is a chain of physiological events happening in our body so your senses send a signal to the brain Okay, okay this is a danger which stimulates the sympathetic nervous system to tell your adrenal glands to produce hormones understood so your sense will signal to the brain that okay there is a danger the the sympathetic nervous system tell your adrenal glands to produce the hormones and which in turn affect multiple organs throughout the body i hope now you have understood this so let's talk about different responses to adrenaline what happens so first let's talk about the body part heart what happens to the heart when adrenaline is released okay so what is the effect of adrenaline the heart beats faster and the blood pressure increases what is the biological advantage kya hoga agar heart pump kar raha hai faster and blood pressure is increasing it sends more glucose and oxygen to the muscles because now the muscles need the energy to run right or even to fight the muscles will need energy so if the heart will beat faster the blood pressure will increase so the heart is able to send more glucose and oxygen to the muscles and what is the effect usse apne body pe kya effect dikhega aapko we will uh, experience a thumping heart okay so this happens when uh, this is the response to adrenaline of heart now what happens to the breathing center of the brain okay so the breathing it becomes faster and deeper okay the brain starts breathing faster and deeper what is the biological advantage increased oxygenation of blood and rapid removal of carbon dioxide 
एंड दिस कॉजेस पेंटिंग हम जो हाफ जाते हैं ना दौड़ते दौड़ते अगर हम हमारे पीछे कुत्ता पड़ गया है तो हमारा ब्रीदिंग सेंटर ऑफ द ब्रेन फास्टर एंड डीपर हो जाएगा ज्यादा ऑक्सीजन मिलेगा हमारे ब्लड को हम तुरंत तुरंत कार्बन डाइऑक्साइड निकालते जाएंगे और जब हम ये कर रहे हैं फास्टर और डीपर ब्रीदिंग ले रहे हैं कार्बन डाइऑक्साइड रैपिडली रिमूव कर रहे हैं तो हमारी सांसें फूल जाती है दैट इज नोन एज पेंटिंग सो दैट इज द इफेक्ट वी फील नेक्स्ट इज आर्टीरियल ऑफ द स्किन हमारी स्किन देखो अक्सर जब हम किसी से लड़ाई कर रहे होते हैं एग्रेशन में होते हैं या हम डर जाते हैं तो हमारी स्किन जो होती है ठीक है एकदम पेल हो जाती है ठीक है पीले पड़ जाते हैं हम डर के मारे कभी देखा है फाइट और फ्लाइट रिस्पॉन्स में पीले पड़ जाना दैट इज पेल हो जाना सो आर्टीरियल ऑफ द स्किन पे हमारा क्या इफेक्ट आता है द एड्रीन कंस्ट्रिक्ट उसको कंस्ट्रिक्ट कर देती है सो इफ इट कंस्ट्रिक्ट देम लेस ब्लड इज गोइंग टू द स्किन मीन्स मोर इज अवेलेबल टू द मसल एंड द पर्सन टर्न पेल आई होप यू आर एबल टू रीड दिस बिकॉज आई थिंक मैं शायद बीच में आ रही हूँ तो आई एम जस्ट गोइंग अवे आई वॉन्ट यू टू रीड दिस और क्लिक द पिक्चर्स मैं यहाँ हार्ट से फिर से दिखा रही हूँ आपको देखो हार्ट का देख लो पिक्चर क्लिक कर लो एट ब्रीदिंग सेंटर ऑफ द ब्रेन देख लो एंड देन दिस इज स्किन ओके द पर्सन टर्न स्पेल नाउ वॉट हैपन्स टू द डाइजेस्टिव सिस्टम ओके what happens to the arterioles of the digestive system adrenaline constrict the arterioles of the digestive system kyunki now the at the time of flight or fight kya aap khana pachane baithoge kya aap khane ko digest karna is important no right it is not important so less blood for the digestive system allows more to reach the muscles now the body is sending less blood to the digestive system and allowing more to reach the muscles because muscles need the oxygenated blood right now और उसकी वजह से क्या इफेक्ट होगा वी विल हैव अ ड्राई माउथ नाउ सी व्हाट हैपेंस टू द मसल्स ऑफ द बॉडी एड्रेनालिन टेंसिस देम उसको टेंस बना देती है उसको कड़क बना देती है एंड दैट इज व्हाई दे आर रेडी फॉर इमीडिएट एक्शन ये उसका बायोलॉजिकल एडवांटेज है एंड व्हाट इज द सेंसेशन टेंस फीलिंग और शिवरिंग ओके वॉट हैपन्स टू द लिवर लिवर क्या जब एड्रेनालिन रिलीज होता है तो लिवर कन्वर्ट मोर ऑफ ग्लाइकोजन टू ग्लूकोज क्योंकि अभी हमें एनर्जी की जरूरत है सो मोर ऑफ ग्लाइकोजन कन्वर्ट्स इनटू ग्लूकोज एंड हेंस ग्लूकोज इज अवेलेबल इन ब्लड फॉर एनर्जी प्रोडक्शन एंड वी डोंट फील एनी सेंसेशन इन दिस केस लिवर में जो भी हो रहा है उससे हमारे बॉडी को फिजियोलॉजिकल सेंसेशन नहीं दिखता है कुछ भी राइट ना नेक्स्ट इज वॉट हैपन्स टू द फैट डिपोजिट लेट मी कम बैक हियर I hope I am visible now. So conversion of fat into fatty acids because we need fatty acid in the blood. क्योंकि fatty acid से ही muscle contract होते हैं बेटा. So what happens to the fat deposit? हमारी body में जो fat deposit है, अगर adrenaline release हुआ, तो वो fat क्या करेगा? Fatty acid में convert हो जाएगा. And this, what is the advantage? That this fatty acid is now available in the blood for muscle contraction. And we don't have any sensation here. ठीक है बच्चों इज इट इज एवरीथिंग क्लियर नाउ इन एडिशन इन एडिशन टू ऑल दीज फंक्शन दैट वी रेड जस्ट नाउ इन फाइट ऑफ फ्लाइट एड्रीनालिन ऑल्सो इंक्रीजेस द क्लॉटिंग कैपेसिटी ऑफ द ब्लड इट डायलेट्स द पीपल ऑफ द आई ओके आई की जो पीपल है उसको डायलेट कर देता है इट स्टिमुलेट्स स्टिमुलेट्स यूट्राइन कॉन्ट्रेक्शन ड्यूरिंग लेबर so during child birth what does it do it stimulates the uterine contraction अपना जो uterus होता है उसको contract करने के लिए stimulate करता है it also stimulates muscle of the hair follicles okay so please नहीं है यहाँ पे so these functions are in general the same as those of sympathetic autonomic nervous system जब हमने nervous system पढ़ा था तब मैंने आपको बताया था ठीक है autonomic nervous system का जो sympathetic है उसके भी same functions थे right so the main function is in fight or flight case so let's talk about now functions of adrenaline most of them we have already done so adrenaline is also termed as an emergency hormone you all know now why it is known as emergency hormone right i had already shown you the picture so first is it increases the heartbeat accompanied by increase in blood pressure next is 
it increases blood supply to the muscles because muscles will require more energy now so it increases the blood supply to the muscles while decreasing it to the skin and visceral organs the main organs just digestive system circulatory system uh, sorry digestive system skeletal system your respiratory system waha sab organs mein na dal ke skin mein na dal ke wo mainly supply kar raha hai muscles mein right now more glucose is released into the blood by the liver abhi humne bataya the glycogen converts into the glucose so more glucose is released into the blood by the liver like putting more fuel into the engine so when we want to run we will put more fuel in the engine in the same way what does liver do with the effect of adrenaline it produces more glucose in the blood okay in case of emergency so remember the final dash to win a race is under the influence of adrenaline so if you have if you remember when we say there is an adrenaline rush in me this is a pro this is a phrase that we use in english so in the end when you run just there is you can see the finishing line and you want to run for the last stretch so the last stretch energy comes only with the with the under the influence of adrenaline okay now so we have done medulla now let's talk about adrenal cortex now what does adrenal cortex secrete see medulla secreted uh, your adrenaline it secretes many hormones but the best known hormone is cortisol we will not be studying about all the other hormones we will be studying about cortisol only and what is the main function it suppresses the inflammation okay so the cortical hormones are categorized as the cortical hormones are of two types mineralocorticoids or glucocorticoids right now mineralocorticoids this regulates the mineral metabolism name se hi we are understanding mineralocorticoids so what is its function it regulates the mineral metabolism especially sodium and potassium ions so in the metabolism of these two minerals mineralocorticoids is useful glucocorticoids it regulates carbohydrate protein and fat metabolism okay carbohydrate protein and fat metabolism okay so in general what does the cortical hormones do okay it increases the blood glucose concentration it influences the fat and protein metabolism and it regulates the salt and water balance in the body so the, these are the general functions of cortical and if you are asked about mineralocorticoids you can say mineralocorticoids is for sodium and potassium ions metabolism and glucocorticoids is for carbohydrate protein and fat but in general the cortical hormones are increasing the blood glucose concentration influence fat and protein metabolism and regulate salt and water balance in the body so this is salt and water balance is by brought about by sodium and potassium balance only correct now glucocorticoids adapt the body to stress such as extreme heat or cold burns infections etc so glucocorticoid help to adapt the body to such stress ki bahut extreme heat hai ya cold hai ya burn ho gaya ya infections ho gaye hain so glucocorticoids help our body to adapt to these changes or this stress then certain cortical hormones behave like sex hormones as well okay they behave like sex hormones they are both male as female as well as female hormones in both sexes and overgrowth of cortex in young children okay leads to premature sexual maturity you know that uh, some children uh, become mature really fast okay so that is because of the overgrowth of cortex in them okay it it brings about premature sexual maturity now you must have seen some women okay uh, in which there is a beard not a full fledged big beard but yes there are people who, there are women with beards okay but you must have noticed some females okay for them there is a overgrowth there is a growth of hair here okay also you must have seen some men mainly you must have seen some bodybuilders and all they have an enlargement of breasts 
okay not exactly like females but yes they have very big breasts in compared to normal men so what is it that is causing these things so if there's an overgrowth of adrenal cortex okay overgrowth of adrenal cortex in mature women then she develops certain male characteristics such as a beard okay you can see mustache okay and deep male voice and this condition is known as adrenal virilism okay it is known as adrenal virilism very important in latin virilism means maleness okay the characteristics of male maleness now if the overgrowth occurs in mature men then they may develop some feminine characters such as enlargement of breasts now let's talk about hyposecretion from the adrenal cortex okay so hyposecretion means less secretion so less secretion from the adrenal cortex will lead to a disease known as addison's disease this is a very important disease so study about this very carefully so what are the symptoms of addison's disease first is loss of energy the person suffering from addison's disease is always low on energy is always fatigued tired all the time then skin pigmentation there will be dark patches on the skin okay okay then there is loss of weight the person becomes very skinny nausea the feeling of vomiting and and you know your head goes on spinning that's nausea then hypoglycemia hypoglycemia we have already studied in our previous chapters the sugar level of the blood decreases so low blood sugar okay then sensitivity to cold and pain they feel extreme pain they are very sensitive towards cold and pain okay and susceptibility to infections they are prone to all the infections okay they easily get infected so these are the different addison diseases sim uh, disease symptoms fatigue and lethargy low mood or irritability weight loss and muscle weakness so you have to basically learn all these symptoms of addison's disease and remember that this is caused by less secretion or hyposecretion from the adrenal cortex okay then hypersecretion of adrenal cortex means excess secretion of adrenal cortex it causes cushing syndrome okay what are the symptoms of cushing syndrome this is also very important obesity the person becomes obese this the fat uh, he, he becomes his mainly the abdominal part is very you can say bulging so the person becomes very fat obese you know obese then hyperglycemia that is higher blood sugar osteoporosis the disease of bones you know that weakness and salt and water retention your body your body cells retain water and salt that is why you the body parts become very swollen okay so these are certain uh, these this is how a person with uh, cushing syndrome will look like very fat he so there will be an emotional disturbance okay there will be osteoporosis in his his or her bones okay he will be obese okay uh, muscle weakness all these things will be there skin ulcers poor wound healing all these things will be there so you have to remember these symptoms of cushing syndrome you have to understand it this is caused by hypersecretion of adrenal so my dear students pancreas is both a duct gland as well as a ductless gland okay it is a duct gland as well as a ductless gland can you see here a blue colored duct so it is pouring its secretion into the duodenum so it is a it has a duct whereas can you see this yellow yellow departments this small small departments these are called islets of langerhans okay and they are a ductless gland so let's talk about it so first as a duct gland we will be talking about pancreas so as a duct gland how pancreas behave okay so as a duct gland its secretion so what is its secretion pancreatic juice okay remember the spelling very well pancreatic juice okay so you can see this that through this duct the pancreatic juice is poured into the duodenum 
okay from here it goes into the small intestine and then you know through this duct this secretion is being poured okay so as a duct gland its secretion that is the pancreatic juice is poured into the duodenum for digestion now if you see here i had already showed you these glands here okay these these ones okay so as a ductless gland now as a ductless gland it has special group of hormone secreting cells so these are the different types uh, groups of cells and these cells these cells what do they do they secrete hormones okay and these group of hormone secreting cells are called islets of langer hands which are scattered in the, in the entire gland where islets means little islands it shows like little little islands are there right so as a ductless gland it has special group of hormone secreting cells and these hormone secreting cells are known as islets of langer hands now see here this is a detailed picture of uh, your pancreas okay so here this you can see the the hole okay so this is the duct this is the duct from where pancreatic juice is poured right now if you see this in middle wait let me take the highlight uh, pointer okay if you take this see this this is these are a special group of hormone secreting cells can you see this light blue this is beta cell okay so this beta cell secrete insulin okay it secretes insulin now can you see this dark blue type of a cells these are alpha cells and alpha cells secrete glucagon okay and then there are these purplish color delta cells and these delta cells secrete somatostatin now somatostatin is not in our portion my dear children so remember the pancreas have a group of okay Uh, uh, hormone releasing or hormone secreting cells okay so the islet produce three hormones what are these three hormones the three hormones are insulin glucagon and somatostatin somatostatin sorry and this is released from three different kinds of cells called beta alpha and delta cells remember beta cells secrete insulin alpha cells secrete glucagon and your delta cell secretes somatostatin clear to you we will not study about somatostatin but we will study about insulin and glucagon in detail so let's start first we will talk about insulin so remember insulin is secreted by beta cells okay it checks the rise of sugar level in the blood it doesn't allow that the sugar level should increase in the blood so whenever there is an increase in the sugar level insulin is secreted so it checks the rise of sugar level in the blood and how it does it does that in two principal ways what is the first way it promotes glucose glucose is nothing but sugar hai na bachcho glucose means sugar okay so it promotes the glucose or the sugar utilization by the body cells what it does it tells the body cells to absorb more and more of glucose and use it okay second it stimulates the deposition of extra glucose of the blood as glycogen in the liver and the muscles what else it does okay so whatever extra glucose is there in the blood okay it stimulates its deposition as glycogen okay so it helps in conversion of okay it doesn't convert it helps in conversion of extra glucose as glycogen and then store it or deposit it in the liver and in the muscles i hope this is clear now let's talk about abnormalities in insulin what happens when there is a shortage or excess of insulin so first let's talk about shortage of insulin that is insufficient secretion of insulin so insufficient secretion of insulin leads to diabetes mellitus you have to remember the spellings very well diabetes mellitus its other name is hyperglycemia okay so insufficient secretion of insulin causes diabetes 
which is more accurately diabetes mellitus okay diabetes are also many types so which type of diabetes here the sugar level increases so this type of a diabetes is known as diabetes mellitus or hyperglycemia okay the word mellitus means honey so it is it refers to the passage of sugar that is more sugar or glucose in the urine okay now so what happens to a diabetic person what are the symptoms of a diabetic person and what does he suffer from so a diabetic person has high concentration of sugar we already know okay we are talking about insufficient secretion of insulin so if insulin is less okay and insulin checks the blood sugar level right so agar insulin kam secrete hua hai to blood mein sugar ka level badh jayega right so a diabetic person has high concentration of sugar in the blood okay which and this condition is known as hyperglycemia we already studied hyper means excess zyada glyce means sugar or glucose and emia refers to blood so hyperglycemia means excess sugar in the blood now it excretes a great deal of urine loaded with sugar so as we studied just now here okay it refers to the passage of sugar in the urine so the urine also contains a lot of sugar so excretes a great deal of urine loaded with sugar next is the person feels very thirsty because of the loss of water through too much urination you know next the diabetic person loses weight and becomes weaker and weaker now in certain cases children the person loses eyesight or vision here the usual treatment by administrating insulin is not a cure so mostly you must have seen ki a diabetic person carries insulin injections with them okay so uh, we administer insulin in the body of the diabetic person whenever the sugar level rises but this is not a cure it is only a method of supplying a hormone which is not being produced by the pancreas so pancreas is insufficiently producing the insulin very less amount of insulin is produced and that is why diabetes mellitus happens right so when we are giving the when we are administrating insulin into the body of a person who is diabetic we are not actually curing it what we are doing it we are supplying the hormone which is not being able not which the pancreas is, is not being able to supply in good quantities correct now what happens when there is an over secretion of insulin so obviously when there is a over secretion of insulin the sugar level will go down hai na it is lowered this this condition is known as hypoglycemia hypo means below okay and glycemia you already know sugar level in the blood so there when there is a low sugar level in the blood because insulin ne kya kiya insulin has reduced the blood sugar level right so what may happen brain may enter a state of coma coma mein chala jata hai insaan and if the level becomes too low even for a few minutes okay so the person may uh, the brain of the person may enter a state of coma if the level becomes too low even for a few minutes okay so please note this down my dear children a similar thing may happen to a diabetic patient if an overdose of insulin is given so this is naturally when there is an over secretion of insulin it leads to glycemia but you know a diabetic patient takes the injection of insulin so if by chance uh, uh, by mistake or by anything if there is an overdose of insulin that has been taken the patient may become unconscious and this is called what is this called this is called insulin shock or again hypoglycemia and uh and prompt intake of sweet biscuit or sugar candy is helpful this is intake okay so whenever you see that a diabetic patient has taken an uh, insulin injection and it is he has become uh, unconscious or not feeling well you give a instant dose of uh, sugar candy or sweet biscuits okay because he is undergoing insulin shock okay now so so saying that insulin converts glucose to glycogen is completely wrong insulin doesn't convert glucose to glycogen it helps okay instead what we can write we can write insulin enables the cell 
to absorb glucose and use it or to convert it into glycogen right insulin itself doesn't convert but it so we should not be writing this statement that insulin converts glucose to glycogen no insulin enables the cells to absorb glucose and use it or convert it into the glycogen so this is the perfect statement but many a times for the ease of saying we say it like this but this is not exactly correct okay now insulin is over now let's talk about the next hormone that is glucagon okay glucagon is secreted from alpha cells okay insulin was secreted from uh, beta cells and glucagon is secreted from alpha cells remember now what does it do it stimulates the breakdown of glycogen in the liver so it what it does in the liver it helps or stimulates in the breakdown of glycogen to glucose and thus it raises the sugar level in the blood so both of them have a, have the opposite function insulin decreases the sugar level in the blood whereas glucagon increases the sugar level in the blood how does it increase the sugar level okay it stimulates the breakdown of the stored glycogen in the liver and convert it into the glucose again and glucose is nothing but sugar so the blood sugar level rises right now let's talk about the role of these pancreatic hormones that is insulin and glucagon in regulating the blood sugar level we have already spoken about it now let's see through a diagrammatic representation now let's see here this is a very interesting diagram see here what happens see we'll start from the liver we know in the liver glycogen okay is converted into glucose correct so when glycogen gets converted into glucose okay so the liver releases glucose so it raises the blood sugar level the blood sugar level will increase because glucogen has glycogen has been converted into glucose so whenever there is a high blood sugar level okay whenever the blood sugar level is high it promotes the insulin release okay it promotes the insulin release now in the pancreas what happens the pancreas release insulin now which cells of the pancreas release insulin we have just understood which cells of the pancreas release uh, insulin which tissue cells beta cells yes so the beta cells of the pancreas what they does it releases insulin now insulin does two things we have already done two things first it stimulates the formation of glycogen in the liver so fir se it goes in the liver and it is stimulating the formation of glycogen so again from glucose glycogen is formed okay so from glucose it is stimulating the formation of glycogen so glucose level will decrease okay by this way the uh, bl blood sugar level will decrease second what insulin does is it stimulates the glucose uptake from the blood so it tells the tissue cells of of muscles kidney fat etc to take up more glucose and utilize it ha na insulin ke do function hai it tells or stimulates the glucose uptake from the blood so it tells the tissue cells it helps the cells to absorb more of glucose and utilize it okay and it also tells the uh, liver to convert the glucose into stored glycogen and in this way it checks the blood sugar level it reduces the blood sugar level so whenever there is an increase in blood sugar level the pancreas the b cell beta cells of the pancreas releases insulin and by these two methods the blood sugar level decreases you understood now now if there is a low blood sugar if it goes beyond that bahut kam ho jata if there is a low blood sugar then what happens it promotes glucagon release how it promotes see here now it goes in uh, in the pancreas it tells the alpha cells what it tells the alpha cells to release glucagon so now glucagon is released now what does this glucagon do it stimulates the breakdown of glycogen so again glycogen breaks down and forms glucose again this glucose goes in the blood and again raises the blood sugar level and so by the function by uh, this uh, harmonious function of the 
secretion of alpha cells and beta cells or we can say secretion of glucagon and insulin this helps in maintaining the blood sugar level i hope you have understood this very well now just we will recap the hormones of the isolate cells okay we just now said that the alpha cells okay we just now spoke about these two but i want to talk about somatostatin also it is not in the portion but a small thing i want to say see alpha cells release glucagon and glucagon stimulates the liver to release glucose and hence what is the effect on blood glucose level it increases the blood glucose level increases by glucagon now the beta cells of the islet cells release insulin it increases the glucose uptake chiefly by muscles and fat cells so if the uh, muscles and fat cells are taking the glucose so the glucose level will decrease right now the delta cells releases somatostatin now somatostatin we don't have to study it is not there in the syllabus but just understand it works it has a dual function so if the blood glucose level are low somatostatin inhibits the release of insulin it stops the release of insulin inhibits okay so if it inhibits the release of insulin the blood glucose level will increase and if the blood glucose level are high then the somatostatin inhibits the release of glucagon it inhibits now the release of glucagon so now the blood sugar level falls down so this is a small introduction of somatostatin so you should be knowing that somatostatin also helps in the same balance okay now so let's quickly revise the hormones of islets of langerhans so insulin released from beta cells it promotes glucose uptake by body cells and it stimulates deposition of extra glucose as glycogen in liver and muscles and what does the deficiency of this causes deficiency causes diabetes mellitus which is called sugar diabetes and the excess causes nerve cell starvation we just now studied coma mein chale jate hain right and brain coma right now insulin is done let's talk about glucagon it is released from alpha cells it stimulates liver to convert glycogen into glucose next is somatostatin from delta cells this is not in syllabus but you have to understand that it, inhib it inhibits the secretion of insulin and glucagon both as and when required okay so let's begin our lecture first of all you should understand the anatomy of thyroid okay so the thyroid is a bilobed you can see here in the diagram there are two lobes of it it is a i'll take a um, laser pointer it is a bilobed can you see there is one lobe and there is this another lobe so thyroid is a bilobed butterfly shaped structure can you see this looks something like a butterfly so thyroid is a bilobed butter shaped uh, bilobed means butterfly shaped structured situa uh, situated in front of the neck just below the larynx so you can see this is the larynx so just below the larynx you can see a thyroid gland okay now this is these are the two lobes i'll take a pen and show you okay so you can see this is one lobe this is one lobe okay and this is another lobe okay and they are joined by this narrow part okay this is known as isthmus can you see isthmus so below the larynx okay thyroid gland is present it is butterfly shaped and it is joined through these two lobes are joined by a narrow isthmus isthmus means an interconnection okay now this thyroid gland secretes two hormones first is thyroxine and next is calcitonin now in many of the textbooks you will see different spellings of thyroxine so it can uh, this is also correct but we will write e here in front of it thyroxine okay so remember that calcitonin is not in our portion right now this is not in our syllabus we have to study only thyroxine so let's talk about thyroxine it regulates the basal metabolism you know what is the basic metabolism that is the rate of cellular oxidation the oxidation that ha happens in each and every cell cellular respiration we can say the rate of cellular oxidation results in heat production at rest so whenever the body is at rest thyroxine helps in the basal metabolism basal metabolism matlab 
कि जो सेल्युलर ऑक्सीडेशन होता है जिसकी वजह से हीट प्रोडक्शन होती है व्हेन द बॉडी इज नॉट वर्किंग ओके ना एट इन एन इंक्रीज इन द सिक्रीशन इंक्रीजेस द मेटाबॉलिज्म एंड अ डिक्रीज इन द सिक्रीशन लोअर्स द मेटाबॉलिज्म ओके सो व्हाट इज इट्स मेन फंक्शन इट रेगुलेट्स द बेसल मेटाबॉलिज्म if its secretion is more if the level of thyroxine is more then metabolism increases okay and if the secretion is less then the metabolism decreases now it also influences the general growth of the body okay so many a times you must have seen even in your uh, textbook there's a picture of a sheep right so one sheep is growing normally in the other sheep they have removed the thyroid gland so if the thyroid is not there thyroxine will not be released so the growth of the body will not take place so it will be a dwarf okay so first function is it regulates the basal metabolism and second it influences the general growth of the body also ossification of bones and body temperature maintenance and maintenance of mental development of our body okay Ma maintenance of mental development now what happens when there is an under secretion means less secretion this is known as hypothyroidism okay so insufficient secretion of thyroxine may lead to three conditions simple goiter cretinism and mixed edema so we'll be talking about all three let's talk about first simple goiter so simple goiter is the enlargement of the thyroid so can you see in this diagram this is the normal thyroid okay can you see this is the thyroid cartilage below there there is thyroid and this is the trachea so this red butterfly shaped by lobed this is thyroid okay and here can you see this is enlarged so much so there is a swelling in the neck also so simple goiter is the enlargement of thyroid and is visible as a swelling in the neck okay so how do we know that the goiter has enlarged by the visible swelling in the neck so you can see this picture here this is how it is visible from outside so this is due to insufficient quantity of iodine in the food okay so this condition is very common in the people living in hilly regions you can see there is a picture i have taken uh, of women uh, living in hilly region you can see all of them are suffering with goiter can you see that okay all of them are suffering with goiter you can see the enlargement here okay so this is due to insufficient quantity of iodine in food this condition is common in the people living in hilly regions where iodine is deficient in the soil to wahan ki jo mitti hai usi mein iodine ki kami hai hence jo bhi wahan pe food grow hota hai usme bhi iodine ki kami hogi right so in the food intake only there is less iodine so now you will say ki ma'am iodine how iodine is related to thyroid okay right now we were talking about uh, the diseases okay where we were talking about under secretion of thyroxine so now you are seeing that uh, this is due to deficiency of iodine so let me tell you iodine is the active ingredient in the production of thyroxine in our body so thyroid deficiency are common in many parts of india the use of iodized salt you must have heard about salt which is iodized so when you go to a supermarket next time when you buy salt next time check they write iodized salt okay so iodized salt is the salt which contains iodine so the use of iodized salt in food is recommended why it is recommended because iodine is the active ingredient in the production of thyroxine so if we have food which is rich in iodine if we intake iodine through food okay then it helps in the production of the hormone thyroxine by thyroid gland okay now the next disease is cretinism so it is a condition which affects the growth of children cretinism is seen in children showing dwarfism okay the height of the kid, uh, child remains small and mental retardation this is due to defective development or early atrophy what do you mean by early atrophy of thyroid means degeneration of the thyroid the thyroid gland itself degenerates okay so that is known as early atrophy degeneration of the thyroid so what is this condition there is mental uh, retardation 
and there is dwarfism you can see here now next is mixed otima it is a condition that affects an adult if his thyroid does not function properly now in this condition the person becomes sluggish very lethargic sluggish with swelling of the face and hands you can see here so you can see the hair also becomes dry coarse and sparse uh, the eyebrows becomes lateral uh, the lateral eyebrows becomes thin uh, there is periorbital edema you can see the swelling mostly below the eyes okay and even here the puffy dull face with dry skin so it is a condition it which affects adult if his thyroid is not functioning properly the person becomes sluggish and there you can see even the swelling in hands and here you can see overall swelling or puffiness in the face now what happens due to over secretion okay less secretion was hypothyroidism and over secretion is hyper hyperthyroidism now excess of thyroxine secretion may also cause a kind of goiter called exophthalmic goiter so this is another type of goiter which is known as exophthalmic goiter okay where exo means outward and ophthalmus means eye okay so it is seen like this okay so thyroid is enlarged okay see inside is the normal size and outside is the enlarged thyroid can you see then here since it is exophthalmic so outer eyes the eyes will bulge out pop out so there are bulging eyes and you can see in the neck also there is goiter so a person having the problem of over secretion shows a marked increase in the metabolic rate his metabolic rate will increase rapid heartbeat shortness of breath saans phoolne lagti hai then eyes are protruded the eyes are protruded uh, it also forms a goiter in the neck okay so let's revise what what happens due to improper functioning of thyroid under secretion that is hypothyroidism causes three diseases simple goiter cretinism and myxotema simple goiter is the enlargement of thyroid cretinism means dwarfism and mental retarded retardation this happens in children myxotema happens in adults this is swelling of face and hands and sluggishness okay now hyperthyroidism that is over secretion causes exophthalmic goiter that is protruding eyes increased metabolism shortness of breath restlessness and so on this module will be talking about the gland pituitary so let's talk in detail about pituitary gland so let me take my pen okay children so pituitary gland is a small projection about the size of a pea pea you know matter okay which hangs from the base of the mid brain below the hypothalamus so below the hypothalamus it hangs okay from the base of the mid brain remember the position it is very very important asked many times in the exam so it hangs from the base of the mid brain below the hypothalamus so this is how the pituitary gland looks like can you see there are two lobes one and two and there is a small you can see here okay intermediary lobe i will tell you about all these parts later on so let's start so pituitary gland is a small projection about the size of a pea which hangs from the base of the mid brain below the hypothalamus it is also known as the master gland okay it's a master gland because it seems to control practically all the endocrine glands it controls all the endocrine glands and stimulates the other endocrine glands to secrete their own respective hormones so what does it do see pituitary gland has two lobes we'll talk about these two lobes later so these two lobes are secreting different different hormones it is secreting acth msh gh tsh and another gonadotropins it is secreting ad adeno anti diuretic hormone prolactin oxytocin all these things okay so what are these hormones doing they are stimulating the other glands like the thyroid stimulating hormone is stimulating the thyroid to release thyroxine are you getting it so what does it do so 
the pituitary gland re releases some hormones and these hormones in turn tell the other endocrine glands to release or stimulate the other endocrine glands to release their own respective hormones as and when required okay that is why it is known as master gland it is very small but is practically controlling all the other glands so now let's talk pituitary gland has two distinct lobes do alag alag lobes hai theek hai can you see here one is anterior lobe and then next is posterior anterior matlab aage ka posterior piche ka anterior pituitary and posterior pituitary the entire pituitary gland weighs only about half gram so the total weight of the full gram is 0.5 gram or half gram the front part of the posterior pituitary is different from the rest of the lobe and is called the intermediate lobe so this intermediate lobe can you see this part this is intermediate lobe okay the intermediate lobe is almost absent in humans but much larger and more functional in some lower animals so let's see this looks like some what like this can you see the darker side darker colored this thing okay this is your intermediary lobe intermediate lobe this is anterior lobe this is posterior lobe okay so first we will talk about anterior pituitary so anterior pituitary releases many hormones so we have categorized first is growth hormone okay gh then thyroid stimulating hormone tsh then there are gonad stimulating hormones also known as gonadotropic hormones now they release three hormones okay children they release a uh, follicle stimulating hormone fsh it release luteinizing hormone lh and it also releases prolactin these are the three hormones that is released and the all three of them follicle stimulating luteinizing and prolactin all of them are collectively known as gonad stimulating hormone okay then there is adrenocorticotropic hormone acth Okay, these are the four broad categories of hormones released by anterior pituitary. Let's talk about each of them in detail. First of all, we will talk about growth hormone. So, anterior pituitary is releasing growth hormone. It is releasing thyroid stimulating, adrenocorticotropic. Then these all three are your gonadotropic hormones. Okay. luteinizing hormone follicle stimulating hormone and prolactin we'll talk about all of them first let's talk about growth growth hormone so it is essential for the normal growth of our body it is also known as somatotropin it is very important to know the other names also very very important for one mark questions somatotropin okay where somatic means body and tropic means stimulating okay so it, it stimulates our body so that our body can grow normally okay so here is the growth hormone you can see it acts on bones muscles and organs so now the deficiency of growth hormone in childhood deficiency of growth hormone in childhood results in dwarfism okay so in dwarfism what happens the adult do not fully the adult, adult do not fully develop okay and retains the body proportions of a child so when we grow big sorry when we age okay so when we are aging our organs and our body parts are not growing as an adult it retains the proportion of a child and we remain like a dwarf when there is a deficiency of growth hormone in childhood did you get it now if there is an over secretion in childhood then this results in gigantism okay so the long bone length grows beyond the normal and the giant and the human giants yahan pe giants aayega okay and human giants up to 2.7 meters in height are produced so they produce giants so both of them okay the deficiency of growth hormone and the over secretion when this happens in childhood we have these two abnormalities one is dwarfism when there is a deficiency of growth hormone there is 
then it is dwarfism the adult do not fully develop and retains the body proportion of a child okay it remains dwarf he looks like an adult okay the facial express face and all looks like an adult okay but the proportions of the body is like of a child okay the long bones the norm overall body growth is with of a child then if there is an over secretion it leads to a disease known as gigantism okay where the long bone lengths are beyond normal they are the long bone length long bones means the long bones hands uh, feet uh, are legs all those long bones okay the femur bones so the long bones length are beyond normal and the human giants up to 2.7 meters are in height are produced then what is acromegaly now children please remember if the over secretion of the growth hormone suddenly occurs in an adult so the first two things that we studied dwarfism and gigantism was the deficiency of growth hormone and the over secretion of growth hormone in childhood whereas when you are a fully grown adult and suddenly there is an over secretion of growth hormone then there is an extra growth of bones okay extra growth of bones in the face particularly the jaw so can you see the jaw line is so big of this man okay and in hands and feet you will see that these palms and the feet and the overall length of these hands are very large okay and the person develops large nose and thick lips can you see large nose and thick lips of this person so this condition is known as acromegaly where acro is height or extremity and megaly means large i hope acromegaly is clear to you this happens when there is an over secretion of growth hormone suddenly in adult now let's go about the next hormone we have studied growth hormone now thyroid stimulating hormone we have already studied the thyroid hormone in uh, the thyroid gland in detail and we know the thyroid uh, the thyroid gland releases thyroxine so what does the, what does our uh, pituitary gland has to do with it okay the pituitary gland releases a hormone known as thyroid stimulating hormone so it stimulates the hor the thyroid hormone okay so thyroid stimulating hormone jo hota hai tsh it activates our thyroid so that the thyroid can secrete thyroxine okay and this is how thyroid stimulating hormone acts on the thyroid gland it stimulates the thyroid gland that okay thyroid gland now you start your functioning now you release thyroid hormone okay thyroxine so we have read about this in detail in the previous class now we'll talk about gonad stimulating hormones or gonadotropic hormones what is as the name suggest gonad so it regulates the activity of the gonads testis is the male gonads ovary is the female gonads right so gonadic gonadotropic hormones are basically of three types first is follicle stimulating hormone so it stimulates the egg formation in female okay and sperm formation in males as the name suggests it is follicle stimulating hormone it is stimulating in the form for the helping in the formation of egg the follicles like egg in females and sperms in males okay next is luteinizing hormone lh it stimulates the formation of corpus luteum to produce female hormone progesterone and it also stimulates the testis to produce the male hormone testosterone i hope this is clear so what does follicle stimulating hormone do follicle stimulating hormone stimulates the egg formation in females and sperm formation in males whereas the luteinizing hormone stimulates the formation of corpus luteum to produce female hormone which is progesterone and testis to produce the male hormone that is testosterone so see here just a second so see here 
three hormones follicle stimulating hormone what does follicle stimulating hormone it is telling the ovaries okay to release eggs it is telling the testes to release sperms now what does luteinizing hormone do luteinizing hormone is telling the ovaries to release its hormone that is estrogen or progesterone and it is telling the testosterone it is telling the testes to release the hormone testosterone is that clear now third is prolactin prolactin is helping in release of milk okay so see here prolactin is telling in is helping in release of milk so three hormones i will again repeat follicle stimulating hormone luteinizing hormone and prolactin clear so these are the three gonadotropic hormones follicle stimulating telling the ovaries to release eggs telling the testes to release sperm luteinizing hormone telling the ovaries to release the hormone and luteinizing hormone is telling the testes to release the hormone whereas prolactin is telling the breast to release milk now we will talk about the adrenocorticotropic hormones acth adrenocorticotropic adrenocorticotropic hormone it regulates the activity of the adrenal cortex we have already learned adrenal gland in detail so it tells the adrenal gland to release its own hormone so see here acth is telling the adrenal cortex to release cortical hormones please note this all of them we have used the word tropic behind them right gonadotropic adenocortropic hai na adenocorticotropic everywhere we have used the word tropic so what does tropic hormone refers to it refers to such hormones which stimulate other endocrine glands to produce their specific hormones okay so what does it do tropic hormones are those hormones which are going and telling the endocrine gland which are stimulating the endocrine gland to produce their specific hormones okay such as gonad gonadotropic hormones secreted by anterior pituitary also stimulate the gonads to produce certain hormones now tropic means influencing the activity of the named organs such as thyrotropic for thyroid adrenocorticotropic adrenocorticotropic for adrenal cortex etc now we have studied the hormones from anterior uh, pituitary now we'll talk about hormones from posterior pituitary so posterior pituitary anterior we have already done now we'll do posterior posterior releases only two hormones oxytocin and vasopressin okay vasopressin it is also known as anti diuretic hormone adh and next is oxytocin let's talk about these two in detail so anterior pituitary we have finished now we are doing posterior pituitary in posterior pituitary we have vasopressin and oxytocin let's talk about them first is vasopressin okay vasopressin is also known as anti diuretic hormone a d h so you have to learn both the names you can say it either anti diuretic hormone or more commonly vasopressin okay there are two major functions first is it constricts the blood vessel with rise in the blood pressure so what does it do it constricts the blood vessels it presses the blood vessels okay so what happens the blood pressure will increase you can imagine it uh, while you are gardening while you are watering your plants okay with a pipe when you constrict the pipe when you press the pipe what do you see the water gushes out with much pressure right in the same way when blood vessels are constricted the blood pressure will rise right now the next function is it acts on the kidney and increase the reabsorption of water from the kidney tubule so it takes up it reabsorbs the water from the kidney tubule therefore the urine will have less water okay the water will get retained in the body water fits hum use kar sakte hain that water is not lost right so see here what is the function of this anti diuretic hormone or vasopressin see first of all vasoconstriction is its function 
what is this function known as vasoconstriction in this the blood vessels are constricted and this increases the blood pressure next is it is against excessive urine production anti diuresis means it prevents making too much urine that is water retention so what does it do it reabsorbs the water from the kidney tubules when it is reabsorbing the water from the kidney tubules less water is here so less urination correct so it is against excessive urine production and both of them lead to increase in blood pressure okay children so i hope anti diuretic hormone is very clear two functions vasoconstriction and anti diuresis and since it is uh, see since it is doing vasoconstriction constriction of the blood vessels that is why it is known as vasopressin and since it is its function is anti diuretic that is why its other name is anti diuretic hormone so with the name only you can such, uh, you can uh, find out its function right now what happens due to deficiency of adh obviously what was the function of adh to reabsorb water so less urine can flow but now the deficiency if it is deficient means more water will flow in the uh, urine so more what uh, urination so deficiency of adh causes diabetes insipidus i had already explained you diabetes mellitus right now this is diabetes insipidus insipidus means this diabetes is also known as water diabetes in common language in this urination is frequent and copious okay frequent matlab bar bar hai copious matlab large volume mein right resulting in loss of water from the body and the person becomes thirsty so here you can see pituitary gland produces insufficient adh and hence the kidney make a lot of urine and you can see the urine there is a lot of urine and the person keeps on feeling thirsty because there is excessive loss of water so remember the word diabetes means passing out excessive amount of urine okay passing out excessive amount of urine we have studied about two diabetes last time we studied about diabetes mellitus where you remember if there is insufficient insulin then the urine contains sugar right sugar absorption is not happening okay so in diabetes mellitus the urine contains sugar caused due to insufficient insulin whereas in diabetes insipidus or water diabetes there is no sugar in the urine there is only excess of water in the urine so insipid what does the word insipid means it means tasteless or blank referring to the absence of sugar in urine whereas this mellitus the melly word means honey or sweet so you remember diabetes means excessive amount of urine but diabetes mellitus means in that urine sugar is there whereas in diabetes insipidus insipid matlab tasteless so no sugar clear to you only excess water now the last hormone is oxytocin in greek oxys means sharp or quick and tokos means child birth so it means quick child birth right it stimulates vigorous contractions of the uterus in the pregnant mother leading to the birth of the baby so what does quick child birth mean quick child birth means see what happens during labor what happens when the child is about to be born baby is about to be born the uterus constricts okay there are contractions of uterus continuously and when there are one after one contraction of the uterus the baby is released out very easily so what does oxytocin do as the name suggest quick child birth it stimulates the vigorous contractions of the uterus in the pregnant mother which leads to the birth of the baby it also helps in ejection of milk once the baby is out of the womb so it does two functions quick child birth okay that is uh, it stimulates vigorous contractions of the uterus and after the baby is born it stimulates the milk ejection from the breasts as well right so what happens here see the baby's growth takes up all the space in the uterus as the baby is slowly 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 growing then 
the strep receptors are activated in the uterus and then the brain signals for the release of oxytocin as the oxytocin is released it causes the uterus muscles to contract and when there are one after one contractions of uterus muscles it leads to and these contractions get stronger until the baby is delivered and hence the baby is delivered with the help of oxytocin quick delivery of the baby with the help of oxytocin so now you know it does two major functions the posterior pituitary releases oxytocin so the release of oxytocin helps in contraction of smooth muscles and baby is born burn uh, baby is born and here on the myoepithelial cell it help it works and it helps in the release of milk so i hope you have understood everything very well i'll just quickly revise anterior pituitary releases growth hormone very important for the overall growth thyroid stimulating hormone which tells the thyroid to release more uh, more hormones adenocorticotropic hormones which tells the adrenal cortex to release its hormones then these all three are your gonadotropic hormones follicle stimulating luteinizing hormone and prolactin now comes the posterior pituitary it releases only two hormones vasopressin which presses the vessels blood vessels increases the blood pressure adh anti diuretic hormone which helps in uh, reabsorption of water in the kidney oxytocin which helps in the release of milk and which helps in the uterus contractions i hope and in this video module we'll be talking about feedback mechanism this is a very important part of the chapter endocrine glands and many students are mostly confused about feedback mechanism so let me make it very very easy for you so that you can score really well let's start so students we all know that living organisms are able to function flawlessly because of complex life processes that control our body functions for example you are able to breathe in and out automatically without realizing likewise your body heats up or cools down depending on the temperature outside you even know when you are hungry because your body signals its need for nutrition so all these above functions occur in our body without conscious intervention from you right you don't even know without you consciously knowing it all of this is happening because of a control or regulatory system called feedback mechanism so feedback systems control the substance that is produced by a life process a substance in turn controls the function of the life process so let me explain you what it is so what is a feedback mechanism a feedback mechanism is a physiological regulation system in a living body that works to return the body to its normal internal state or commonly known as homeostasis okay so uh, this is a regulation system in our body and it helps uh, it helps our body to return to the normal state okay or it maintains homeostasis now what is negative feedback but so you should understand that most feedback mechanism in our body are of negative type only okay most feedback mechanism in our body are of this type only for example blood sugar level let's talk about what it is see the body has a mechanism to maintain a normal state whenever there is a change in this state there are messages through the body systems to increase if there is a fall below the normal so whenever there see whenever uh, there is something below the normal okay so our body okay sends a message okay it sends a uh, this feedback mechanism basically sends a message through the body system to increase if anything is falling below the normal okay then the negative feedback system what does it do it it tells okay whenever there is a change in the state there are messages through the body systems to increase if there is a fall below the normal or to decrease if there is a rise above the normal okay so this kind of ordering for opposite is called negative feedback to restore the normal state for example when our blood sugar level falls down okay so the negative feedback system what does it do it sends the message to the body 
system to increase the blood sugar level okay and whenever the blood sugar level is more it sends a signal to decrease it this is a this is ordering for opposite that is why it is called a negative feedback see i will explain you through this chart out here see this is blood sugar level okay so blood sugar rises after the meals in our body okay so blood sugar has risen so what does the negative feedback do it commands to lower the level how it will do it how what it will do so it will command to deposit the extra sugar in the liver okay so the correction is carried out and the normal level is restored or now what happens when the blood sugar level falls down during physical exercise when you have exercised a lot or when you have fasted so after that the sugar level falls down so now the negative feedback system want what it wants to do it wants to increase the blood sugar level so now it tells the liver to release it okay and the correction is carried out and the normal level is restored i hope you have understood this very well we have we have read this in our previous chapters also where we were talking about this insulin and diabetes and all those things right now let's talk about positive feedback mechanism now in positive feedback mechanism the original stimulus is promoted rather than negated this is very important line in the negative feedback system what happened when the blood sugar level was falling down okay then uska ulta hua tha the uh, negative feedback told them to increase the blood sugar level right but here what happens the original stimulus if the if suppose some level is increasing so positive feedback system what does it do it promotes it the increase it promotes so it goes on and on and on and increasing if something is decreasing it promotes in decreasing it right so positive feedback increases the deviation from the ideal normal value so it doesn't allow it to come to the normal value it deviates it from the normal value right so they are very few you should understand most of the mechanism in our body are negative feedback positive feedback system are very few one example very very important example of a positive feedback is of uterine contractions during childbirth you know how a child is birth during how a child is born during labor the uterus has contraction okay so one after one if there are contractions one after the one contraction are there then only the baby is pushed out very easily so what happens normal state of uterus is uncontracted normally our uterus is not contracted right so if one contraction begins to agar negative feedback hota so what will happen it will negate it it will do opposite of it but now it is positive feedback so if contraction is happening instead of commanding it to come to the normal it tells it to it gives a message it to continue contracting further right so it keeps on contracting further till the delivery is completed i hope you have understood this so one example is that of uterine contractions during childbirth normal state of the uterus is uncontracted on contraction instead of commanding to come to normal it gives a message to continue to contract further so positive feedback till delivery is completed now i will explain this general scheme of both negative and positive feedback mechanism watch carefully so once the normal state is altered changed so sensory receptor receives this change ke okay there is a change so suppose there is a rise in level of some substance in our body okay so what does the negative feedback will do so if there is a rise it will command to bring it down hai na negative karne ka so the control center what does it do it commands to bring see control center commands to bring it down correction is done and the normal state is restored clear but what happens see now i have told you about negative feedback now is the same i am telling you about negative feedback only now if there is a fall okay if there is a fall in something then the negative feedback says ke okay isko bada dena hai so negative feedbacks goes to the control center it commands to raise it the correction occurs and the normal state is restored now in both the scenes what happens when there is a positive 
okay so when now let me change the color okay now when the normal state is altered the sensory receptor receives and if there is a rise of some substance then what does the positive feedback do it increases it further the positive continues so there is an abnormality right normal state is not restored किसी कोई चीज अगर बढ़ गया है तो पॉजिटिव फीडबैक उसको और बढ़ाती रहती है और फिर वो एबनॉर्मेलिटी में कन्वर्ट हो जाता है एंड इफ समथिंग हैज फॉलन समथिंग हैज फॉलन मतलब कम हो गया है कोई सब्सटेंस सो पॉजिटिव फीडबैक उसको और कम करती है इट फॉल द फॉल कंटिन्यूस एंड दिस इज ऑल्सो एबनॉर्मेलिटी सो यू शुड अंडरस्टैंड नाउ दैट विथ द नेगेटिव फीडबैक ऑलवेज वेदर द सब्सटेंस इज इंक्रीज और डिक्रीज with the negative feedback you see here through here the normal state is restored the normal state is restored whereas in positive feedback you get abnormality if there is a rise it will continue rising if there is a fall it will continue falling right so i hope you have understood the general scheme of both the negative and the positive feedback mechanisms both these diagrams are very very important this general scheme okay and this blood sugar level blood sugar level i think you can do very very well but you should understand this as well and a very important is the example of positive feedback mechanism uterus contractions so i hope you have understood this concept really well if you have enjoyed watching this video give it a thumbs up write in the comment section and show us your love and do share it with your friends thank you and keep the learning on